Hey, it's Jessica Namasa with WTF Health. What's the future health? I'm talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today we're talking to one of my favorite health tech and digital health investors. We've got Brian Roberts. He's a partner at Venerock. Brian, great to see you. Hey, Jess. Hey, thanks Jess. for having me. You're my favorite too. Aw, thank you. That's so nice. All right, so we are going to talk about what the heck is going on in this whole healthcare innovation space. And to do it, we're not only going to get your take like off the cuff, you know, Brian Roberts style in the, in the way that only you can deliver it, but we're also going to use the results of Venrock's 2023 healthcare prognosis survey, which just came out um, recently. And this survey was like 300 people responded. They're like the folks who were on your and um, Bob Coach email list. So you got a whole bunch of folks from the innovation ecosystem weighing in on everything from like macro environment stuff, like, you know, the federal interest rates, what the stock market's going to do this year, the war in Ukraine, all the way to very health tech specific stuff like chat GPT and what's happening with GLP ones and, you know, which companies are going to get acquired this year and where the funding numbers are going to end up. And so we're going to get to all of that. But first, let me get your big take. So you saw the survey results. You're living your life over there at Venrock. Um, you're talking to your portfolio companies. You're talking to other investors. You're talking to buyers. You know, what do you think state of play? Give it to us high level, and then we'll walk through some of the pieces of this survey to kind of guide sure. the rest of the conversation. But what's going on, Brian? <laughs> yeah, sure. So um, I think what's going on for people in health tech is very, it's bifurcated depending on whether you were one of those companies that drank the Kool-Aid of the 2010 to 2020 timeframe, which was sort of scale it before you nail it, right? And they and they, they really like top line growth is all that matters. They grew, grew, grew before they'd really figured out the product and the product economics, right? So there's that, there's, there's that group of folks. The other group of folks are people who are like, no, 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 I'm going to be a little non-consensus back in the go-go days. And they figured out what their product was and then they grew, right? So in it was probably by late 21, people figured out, whoa, 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 the market's changed, right? Like really the public stock started to drop in March of 2020, early 2021. Mm -hmm. And then the indices peaked in late 21. And then over the course of 2022, gosh, probably most companies did riffs. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that allowed most of the private companies to push off fundraising. Right. But now in 23 and in 24, we're coming down for the private companies where the rubber's going to hit the road on needing more dollars to go prosecute their vision. And I think you're really, I think you're actually are beginning to see this bifurcation, right? And so while for probably 18 months, the growth equity private financing market was pretty frozen, that's beginning to unfreeze a little bit now for, for companies who have really good, interesting businesses, but probably raised at too high a price two or three years ago. They've now grown into that valuation, right? Whereas the companies that grew too fast, too early, that's a tougher, that's a tougher nut. Right. Like that's not only a boy, we need more money, but we need to restructure our business because investors are frankly much more concerned about the downside of prolonged high cash burns than they were. Right. Um, I think that uh, we're beginning to see certainly some increased outreaches from earlier stage companies who are having trouble financing, looking for homes. And I think you're gonna see that like, only accelerate. And honestly, like, you know, though such though, thus far actually growth rates and actual operational performance of companies have not has not been hugely impacted. So like the RIF stuff was pretty good. Like it was kind of like, you know, when you when you go from, you know, post Christmas eating for too much for two weeks to like, I'm going to try and get myself into bathing suit shape in May, right? Like it's, it's all still good, but you just are more efficient and, and, and doing better. That's, that's probably a, a high level. Do you think, um, I'm curious on this, do, you know, you're talking a lot more about the startup side and like how that's playing out within those companies, but on the investment side, does this mark a big C change in the way that you're seeing other health tech investors 
you know, fund the space because I mean, to your point, like a lot of that, you know, grow fast, like, you know, scale it before you nail it. Like that was the investment climate we were in. And there were a lot of new investors that came into the space that weren't really familiar with digital health or health tech or, you know, some of the new, you know, value-based design business models that they were throwing money into. So, I mean, like, do you feel like overall the funding climate in healthcare, like from that, if you're looking at the investor side of it, has the the thesis or the, the, the mechanism by which investors are looking at these companies, has that changed now? Too? For sure. So okay. you've got many fewer investors actually investing, right? Lots of them are still saying they're investing, okay. um, but but met most probably for that last decade, you know, uh, investing became sort of a thing of like go find a new deal to invest in, put in money, and then move on to the next deal, right? So it was all new investment focused for lots of folks, right? Um, Today, everybody's focused on their portfolio, mm. right? And so they're, uh, so your people are focused on their own portfolio. People want to stay in the flow of things. So they say they're investing, but not, but, but many people are not, especially the ones who have very large portfolios because they raised big funds and stuff like that. And then there's a whole swath of the later stage growth investors who today, Honestly, they they can invest publicly or privately. Public valuations are now 80% lower than they were two years ago and pretty stable, Yeah. right? Whereas a bunch of those shoes still have to drop in the private financing world and you don't have liquidity, right? So I think you have a, a pretty big current exodus out of the space by a bunch of people who were recent entrants over the last okay. 10 years and a bunch of people who are preoccupied with the 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 bets or perhaps mistakes that they made that they made over the last 4 or 5 years um so it actually it actually narrows narrows down pretty fast which is why why I think you see you know not only are have investors hurdle rates and what they're looking for gone right used to be all growth now it's yeah I want growth but I want I want visibility to low cash burn to profitable, right? And it's got to be compelling enough to take my attention away from my current portfolio and trying to help those companies do their stuff. Uh, you know, hap- happily for us, we're actually we're closing three deals uh, in the healthcare space in the next month. So, like oh. things are, but that's. Again, that's not oh like we're all investing. It's it, you know we've been working on for one of them on twelve for twelve months, right? So like wow, okay. it's statistics to the, it's statistically small group of things too. Yeah, and I've been hearing from entrepreneurs that deals are taking funding is taking longer to get to that finish line than ever before, and totally. even if it's just a yeah. So and it, the it's proctology exam, the proctology exam is much deeper too. <laughs> Very probing at this point, yes, right? There you go. <laughs> You're in healthcare, obviously. I mean, I love that. That's great. <laughs> okay, so this brings us like to one of the survey points that I wanted to talk about with you, which was where the 2023 funding numbers end up. So like, kind of a mixed result on this one. So 50% of the survey respondents said that they thought it would be between 10 billion and 15 billion. And for point of reference, last year we ended up at 15.2 billion. So think people thinking that we're gonna end up, you know, half the respondents yeah. saying less than last year. And and then it was like there was a quarter that were like below the 10 billion and then the quarter that were above the 15 billion so it was like a wide swap yeah. you know i'm curious you know where you think we might end up if you want to if you want to put a marker yeah. in the sand yeah. and also so you know the- what what do you think Brian are, are the factors that are going to impact what happens on the back end of this this year to to either get those funding numbers up into that 15 to 20 or or keep, or actually keep them down below 15 i think it's going to be below Okay, is my okay. stake in the ground? All right, this um, is where this I is think, the marble you're yep, putting in. in that my, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm putting that in. Um, I think it's going to be below. Uh, I think that there will be many fewer deals done, and deal count. But the real reason it will be below is that the growth financing market is going to be much more selective, and those are the big checks, right? Like the three hundred million dollar checks and stuff like that, right? Um, the what could push it up is if there's real 
capitulation on valuation by a bunch of insiders in a bunch of these growth finance companies that that need restructuring and stuff like that. Um, I think, but I think I think financings will be down, and I think M and A will be up. I think M and A will be way up. Probably gets to probably your next question. It's the flip side of that coin. Yeah, let, let's talk about the flip side of that coin. So <laughs> keep going. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, as you noted, right? You're hearing financings are taking a lot longer, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's going to, and there are, you already see it uh, quietly, you know, uh, being done is, you know, companies that don't quite have the scale, don't quite have product market fit, don't quite have their unit economics, or, you know, sadly, you know, maybe they have some of that, but they had an investor base that's totally disappeared. Yeah. Right. Like you're going to see some of that. You always see that in a downturn. All of those folks are at least parallel processing, looking for a home for the company versus financing. And uh, you're going to see more and you're going to see more and more of it. You'll see more rifts, right? As people struggle with financing and have to restructure because they haven't gotten the unit economics. Like, I think you'll see that in a bunch of the hybrid care mm -hmm. companies. I think you'll see it in a bunch of the DTC companies, places that are, uh, sensitive to customer acquisition costs and the buildup that you need in, in expenses in order to grow. So looking at m a you know, the, the we, survey talks about, you know, the most likely to be acquired this year, Carbon Health, Noom, and Oscar. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, do you agree with that? And and also, what's your take on which area within like health tech or, you know, digital health or some of these innovative care model design? I mean, you mentioned virtual farms here, this direct-to-consumer space. Where do you think there's going to be a lot of m a activity? I mean, my money is on that mental health space because I feel like mm -hmm. that was one of those places that just blew up and there was any number of company that just got funding during like the tail end of the pandemic and right after but you know to now totally like but so i think you got to break out though you know aqua hire m a like really uh really poor return m a from decent return m a okay right so okay so do that my <laughs> my, my my worry about a bunch of the mental health space is that there's so many so subcritical with so few barriers to entry that they're going to end up being uh, more fire sale-ish M&A than ongoing entity M&A, right? I think the, I think that the, the ones that will, will be sort of ongoing entity M&A, there's got to be a better term for that, will be, will be things like carbon care companies. Okay. They could be, they, they could be uh, vertically, you know, focused yeah. on a, a disease area or a population type. Um, but there, but so many folks, especially the big players in the ecosystem, are trying to build out their care assets, right? In order to improve both the outcome and efficiency of care delivery. That I think those are the those are the ones that will see. And I think in a funding environment like we're in now, I think it's much harder to raise the capital to grow those businesses because they're so capital intensive, right? You even saw um, CVS Aetna on their earnings call, right? Saying, God, we're so happy we're closing the Oak Street acquisition because now we can get their new starts off our income statement. Yeah. Like, you know, Jiminy Christmas. <laughs> Your overall take on this great Jiminy Christmas. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> Talk to me, Brian, about the the outcome of the Silicon Valley bank crash, because I want to hear your take on this as an investor. I mean, first sure. of all, like what, ha like tell me from your point of view, like what, like what kind of words needed to be said to the portfolio companies that you guys work with? And then even amongst, you know, your, your peer group of, of other venture capitalists, like how earth shattering was this when it happened? And what do you think the fallout is going to be? I mean, the survey talks about, you know, a higher 
higher cost of capital moving forward. We're having to work with the too big to fail kind of banks. And that yeah. obviously changes, you know, the appetite for risk that's going to go behind some of the, the financing yeah. for some of these deals. So what happens to the innovation ecosystem writ large? I mean, tell sure. me what you think. Sure. So, um, so it was a totally hairy 72 hours. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do think, look, it's sort of like the 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 notion that uh, good times breeds lazy thinking, right? Like if you if you live in a time of plenty, like you worry less about starving, right? And then things change, and you haven't put in place the the necessary prerequisites to be able to adapt and succeed. And my sense is that's what happened at, at a bunch of these regional banks, right? The the big issue around the collapse was in a fit of irony, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed in the 24 hours or something that most companies were trying to pull payroll for their mid-month wow. payroll, okay? And that's what that's what the weekend was spent on, really, yeah. was how do you, how does one make sure that there's not a disruption to thousands of employees, right? Who not only don't deserve, but probably can't handle, right? That sort of a disruption. And so like, that was the weekend. And that got, so like, when we solved that, like, you know, the, the different different folks did all sorts of different things. Um, we made loans to a bunch of companies. Actually, not even, we made loans directly to the payroll provider in order wow. to make sure that the funds would get there. Um, in order for payroll to get paid. Honestly, I think that there will be lots of people, and I have heard some already, who use the Silicon Valley Bank collapse as a an excuse for some other underlying problem that exists. Like, oh, I would have succeeded, but Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. So, and at a way to sort of put off uh, responsibility for it. So, and I think it's going to be a pretty big red herring there from the perspective of how does it change life in the ecosystem? Yeah. Look, a bunch of the Silicon Valley bank guys have moved over to Hong Kong, Shanghai bank, and they're trying to restart up essentially Silicon, what they would call, you know, safety with service, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> right. Um, uh, the, the, the big banks, JP Morgan, B of A, and so on, um, have tried. I would say the jury is still out on how successful they are going to be at over the medium term, like leave aside the Monday, Tuesday after Silicon Valley Bank collapses, but over the medium term, how well they're going to be able to interact with and serve the small clientele. Yeah. But- in all honesty, like there's a need in the market. I don't think it's possible that there will be some disruptions in loan, in cheap loans for a while, right? Because you you, know, you sort of have two loan providers to venture back companies, ones that are backed by deposits like Silicon Valley Bank was, and ones mm -hmm. that are backed by hedge funds, right? And there are a bunch of, you know, those sorts of debt providers. And those debt providers, um, the ones backed by hedge funds are more flexible and more expensive, right? Um, yep. Silicon Valley Bank had a nice, uh, a nice niche in that market of being flexible and cheaper for people with whom they had long-term relationships. That that will pop back up. I hope so. Okay, good. Good to hear that. All right. Does anybody go public this year? I mean, but the survey asked this question beautifully because it wasn't like, will anybody go public this year? It's like, of the companies rumored to be going public soon, yes. which will be the most successful over the next five years? And so survey said top three, and you could pick from the list or you could write in like your own anonymous yeah. pick. Sure. Um, but the top three there were Devoted, ALD, and Lira Health. And I think like all, you said, all three of those are yours, which is pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious though, you know, okay, what are your thoughts on that?
And you, furthermore, this is the thing that, that made me laugh when I read that survey question was, what does success even mean as a publicly traded yeah, healthcare so, innovation yeah, company? Sure, I mean, sure. is longevity like cash flight? I mean, regardless yeah. of stock price or is it more yeah. like, uh, you know, getting acquired by a big player like CVS acquiring Oak Street? Like what, what is success anymore in, in a five-year period on the, on the open market? Super, super, <laughs> super, fair, super fair question. And it's actually the reason that we posited the question that way right um because well you saw lots of people go public over the last couple of years um and a bunch of them um are declaring bankruptcy now right so like like we can't like that's it's it's hard to say it's hard to to describe going public as the success metric right, right? so um so, so going public is hopefully a liquidity metric mm -hmm. and then an, and a, a marker for the next stage in the life of a business. Um, but what we were hoping to draw out was who, who does the group of 300 or 400 folks think are, are really good businesses, right? In the notion that, again, there was, uh, maybe it was Ben Graham who said that, you know, in the short term, the stock market's a voting machine and in the long term, it's a weighing machine. Oh, otherwise, otherwise said, like the stock market can be wrong, high or low in the short in short term, but over the long term, quality wins out, right? Mm -hmm. And so our hope was to understand like who did people think there would be quality, right? So if if all these companies went public, right, who wouldn't be Babylon or somebody, right? Um, you know, poor pair people like that, and uh, so I do think there will be. I think there will be IPOs generally. I bet there will not be IPOs in health tech, maybe in the care space. But what? So leave aside in the venture backed health tech. In the venture backed, so okay. Private equity, totally possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, but those are oftentimes more services businesses or roll ups or bigger things. In the, in the venture backed healthcare IT space, I don't think, I bet there won't be. Okay. I think that I yeah I feel like I agree with you on that, but we'll we'll have to see what the end of the year brings. Well, and right. like let's be clear, uh, the anybody who's going to get public by the end of the year is going to be doing it off of twenty twenty two numbers and has to be it, it, pretty you know getting pretty well wired with their S one their IPO prospectus and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So time's kind of running out on that. Okay. All right. So growth areas. Survey yes. asked about this. This was great. Like the number one, it's like this giant category of like big data, generative AI, analytics. Clear winner, number Everybody's one. Everybody's got then, AI on the brain. Yeah, of course. <laughs> like chat GPT. Like I right. want yeah, is that what fueled that you think? But I mean, and then it's like it goes into telehealth and like remote patient monitoring. Then it's and then it, this was what's funny to me. It's like tied for third was like Medicare Advantage and wearables, which was a surprise. I no, no, I just, just say, I, I'm assuming. <laughs> I, I'm, assu I'm assuming the the poor performance of the sort of startup insurers has driven has driven MA and value based care down. Um, but like wearables, other than if you're Apple, has been a terrible business Always. since the dawn of time. And so <laughs> I felt kind of bad uh, for the poor MA. ACO value based care folks like I think last year they were like number one everyone thought this is the place to be and now they're you know down back in the corner drinking a beer with the wearables guys like it's freaking terrible <laughs> So interesting. It's like, well, I mean, I see where it could go hand in hand with the telehealth category. Like, oh, well, we're going to need to remote monitor these people with a wearable. I don't know. I, that category has always been a mystery to me. Yeah. But I mean, what is, what's your pick on this? And do you think like the exuberance around that whole generative AI and, and big data analytics, yeah. that space, do you think that that's overblown? I mean, we saw a huge investment actually just made $50 million, Andreessen and General Catalyst together. Yeah. Yeah, I saw um, that into, this was it, it's um, Hippocrates AI? Hippocrates right? AI. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, okay, so is this just, and I, from my understanding, I don't think they have a business model. It's kind of like an exploratory look at what could happen with chat GPT. It sounds, that, sounds like every, is, that sounds like every seed deal that was ever done. Just nobody ever admits it. So God bless those guys <laughs> for actually admitting that like we put a bunch of money in with some people we like in an area and we're going to go explore. Um, Do it. <laughs> 
I would I tell that. you, so I think, I think the AI stuff is going to be really, really useful. Okay. I think it's going to really help with administrative tasks. It's going to like, I think it's going to, I think it's going to free up a bunch of time and increase a bunch of quality on stuff. Personally, I don't think it's going to be that hard to integrate into products. Like we have a couple of growth stage companies that were that I mean, they've got data science teams, they've got ML teams, and this stuff came out. And eight weeks later, they'd integrate. Like mm. that's not that hard. Like that doesn't count as hard in my mind, yeah. right? And so, um, so I think that it will be very important to successful companies. I don't think it will be the thing that is the hard thing to do. I think that the piping into the EMRs and the, into other stuff, I think the customer acquisition, I think all those other things that have historically been hard things for healthcare IT companies will continue to be hard. And those will be the things that will determine success or failure rather than the generative AI part. Okay. I mean, we we saw that. It, it felt like, you know, there were a lot of AI companies that were doing cool things through the pandemic that raised a lot of money um, that are just, you know, selling things off as pieces at this yeah, point right now. Sure. And so, you know, it's it's curious about- Yeah, you know, poor, how that poor, does get poor Olive's been holding exactly a garage thinking, sale you know, for like a year. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they were, they had so much hype behind what you, how you started out your answer, you know, in terms of talking about taking away some of those administrative tasks. And there's a lot of, I, 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 I love talking to these companies that take on one little specific piece of this in the hopes to build a platform that then can be, you know, applied to all of it, but yet to see like a clear winner emerge in that space. Um, but so it's interesting to see what will happen there. All right. Wrap this up for me, Brian, and tell me, you know, what's what's going on with Venrock? You you teased us with the three deals closing here soon, but I'm sure you can't yep. say anything about that. But so tell us what's going on, and and if you if you want to give us an idea of like what you're hot on right now still, and yeah. um, you know sure. what you're what you're not hot on so much anymore. Wrap it up for us. So, uh, so we are honestly we are just plugging away. We continue <laughs> to do eight to 10 deals broadly across tech and healthcare a year. We tend to 80% of them end up being seed in series A. We are seeing here and there um, an interesting later stage deal that now because of the change in the market is priced well enough for us to be interested in it. We invested uh, last year in Smith RX, the transparent PBM, right? Again, yep. later stage, they, they were growth stage essentially um but the change in the market and you know we liked it um so i think we're going to see a little bit more of that in addition we'll continue to really to try to drive into this data tech enabled services to improve the efficiency and cost of care whether you're doing it in a full stack perspective like yeah. devoted is whether you're trying to partner with primary care docs like alidate is um, or even some of the earlier stage stuff. We just uh, we started a company to go into sort of more much uh, much sicker population subpopulations mm. and partner with payers to help them do that. So I think that's the place. But I will tell you honestly, I feel like I have now been doing this 26 years, nearly totally strategy free, right? Like I. <laughs> I spend my time trying to meet with and talk with really smart people. And nearly every time I sit with someone like you and I'm like, oh, I totally hate this space. Like six months later, I make an investment in that space. Like, it's just so silly, right? Because it's all about the person and their approach to a problem that, so we're very bottoms up. I, in the same way, I interview some companies. I'm like, I don't understand their model. How will this ever be? Uh, and then I'm like, I love them. I, I, I fall in love with everybody I interview pretty much at this point. It's good. <laughs> I don't know how you do your job. Um, so wait, before you go then, I, you know, I'm you know, curious, like um, 26 years, I have to ask this because it's it's rare I get to talk to somebody who's got that kind of longevity in their role in this space. Is everybody's afraid that this is the end of health tech, digital health. You've weathered storms before. I mean, bubble, no bubble. Uh, is it over? And, no, and it's the, not the, over. The, the, what it's do you think? Over. No. Okay, no it's way. not over. Like, I do, I, do think, I do think this downturn is more... 2000 to 2004 than it is 2009, 2010, right? Like 2009, 2010, the supposed great financial crisis was like 
it was so short, right? That it bare, it didn't leave that many scars in our space, right? Mm -hmm. When you get out to three or four years, right? There's real sorting of wheat from chaff and you people, people dig in. And I think that's what we're in for. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I just, I love hearing totally. your perspective, um, it, not only as an investor, but just having like that longitudinal perspective and then the good sense of humor wrapped around. It doesn't hurt anything. So I appreciate that. Even way with thank words. You. <laughs> it was fun. All right. Well, thank you so much. And for those of you who want to check out these survey results that we were talking about, I'll throw the link in the description so you can check it out for yourself. See where people came in on GLP-1s. That's the one thing we really didn't talk about. But um, it's uh, lots of good information there for you guys to take a look at. I'm Jessica Damasa. And for more with those who are changing the way that we do healthcare, you can check out my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash WTF Health. We'll talk to you soon. Brian, thanks again for everything. We'll talk to you later. You got it. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Bye.